Shinshu Genzo. Shinji means Chinese characters. So Shinji Shoko Genzo is a, a collection of Chinese stories from ancient teachers that uh, <coughs> Dogen collected during his lifetime and he, then he um, wrote them down and he also um, wrote some comments about them. And all the stories are conversations between a teacher and a student. Or in, in China, it was a, a master in a temple and his monks. And um, there are 300, 300, just over 300 of them that he collected. And we translated them into English and published them in a book. So I just have to find an interesting one because some of them are very strange. Sorry. Can I ask uh, who, has, who has this book? Because I gave a few of them in my group. Does anyone have this group? Martin Yegdo to Love New Roma? Because I gave, yeah, I gave some of them to people in my group. To, so, so, I, bought, I bought it. I yeah, bought good. So almost half people know the book and have it at home. Okay. And Mike, you mentioned we translate it, so does that mean yeah. you, you and yes. someone? Okay. Uh, there were uh, three of us. And, um, oh, I'm pressing the wrong button. Three of us translated it and then I published it in 2003. So this story is between two very famous Zen teachers in China in the 9th, 10th, 10th century. Um, I'll, I'll shorten some of it because uh, there's lots of titles of the masters. But one, one, um, one master is called Master Nangaku and he's the teacher. And he has a student called Basso. But Basso became a master later on. So in these stories, if he became a master later on, they call him master. So it sounds strange that a master is talking with a master. <laughs> but it's just the Chinese way of writing. Everybody has to have their title. So I'm going to change it a bit so you can understand. So, um, Monk Basso <clears throat> served as Master Nangaku's personal secretary. That means he uh, helped him arrange meetings and looked after him and maybe made sure that his robes are folded properly and all, lots and lots of different things. Not, not particularly as we think today. Your know, secretary is uh, writing and letters and so on. So nothing like that, but personal assistant maybe. So Basso was personal assistant to Master Nangaku. And he lived in Dempo Temple. Uh, he, the phrase is quite interesting. He intimately received Gautama Buddha's mind seal. You know what a seal is? Red stature. So in Chinese, mind seal is an interesting phrase 
it means that he had the same mind as Gautama Buddha, sealed on his mind. <laughs> so Gautama Buddha's mind was stamped on his mind. And it's a very beautiful phrase in Chinese. He intimately received Gautama Buddha's mind seal. <laughs> and he lived in Denpo Temple. I'm not sure where that was. Constantly sitting in Zazen. He loved to sit in Zazen. He was always sitting in Zazen. And he was the most outstanding of Master Nangaku's students. Master Nangaku knew that Basso had exceptional ability in studying Buddhism. So they had a very good relationship. Then Master Nangaku went up to Basso and said, Now, great monk, what is your intention in practicing Zazen? What's your intention? Okay, so. And Basso says to his master, I intend to become a Buddha. Fair enough. <laughs> 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 then Master, Nang Master, Master Nangaku bends down on the, on the ground and picks up a piece of tile you know the tile from the roof and he catches hold of the pot tile and he finds a stone and he starts going like this with the tile on the stone he's polishing the tile on the stone and uh, Basso looks at his master and says, What are you doing, master? <laughs> and Nangaku said, I'm polishing this tile because I want to make a mirror. <laughs> and uh, Basso says, How can polishing a tile make a mirror? And Nangaku says to him, How can sitting in Zazen make you a Buddha? So that's one part of the story. Can you understand? He was being rather humorous and sarcastic and he was talking about something about intention. If we intend to make ourselves into a Buddha, it doesn't work. Then the story goes on. So Basso says to him, well, what's the right thing to do then? And Nangaku says, when a man is riding in a carriage, if the carriage won't move forward, <coughs> what's the right thing to do? Should we hit the carriage with a stick or should we hit the top the horse with a stick? And Basso couldn't find any reply. Then Nangaku said more. He said, learning Zazen is learning that you are a Buddha in Zazen. You are already a Buddha in Zazen. When you learn Zazen, it is different from everyday behaviour like sitting or lying down. However, when you are learning that you are a Buddha in Zazen, that Buddha doesn't have a fixed form. It's not a thing. It's not a person. <coughs> and Nangaku said, At the moment of the present, in the universe, we should not prefer good or bad. We shouldn't choose between good or bad. 
when you practice being a Buddha in Zazen, you get rid of the concept, the idea of Buddha. If you become attached to the form of sitting, you haven't understood the principle of Zazen perfectly. Can you understand? Strange story. Hearing the Master's teaching, Basso felt as if he had drunk sweet honey wine. End of story. <laughs> <laughs> discuss and write an essay of two pages each, please. <laughs> <laughs> Can anybody say what, what the story is about for you? Or is it too, too much to ask? dropping off even the idea of being a Buddha. Uh, we have to remember that in China and Japan, in ancient days, um, there were lots of teachings, um, lots of different kinds of teachings, and some of them taught that you practice meditation to become something special. That was quite strong teaching all over China and I suppose in other Buddhist countries too, I don't know. So the, the teaching that when you sit in, in Zazen, you give up trying to be anything was um, um, there not so many people teaching that. Lots of teachers were saying you know, you try very hard and you sit very beautifully and then you become a better person and a better person. So you become good and your bad things disappear. And this story says, uh, no, forget about being better, being good, or not being good enough. Is my zazen good enough? Am I sitting properly? Forget about all that. Forget about whether you're a Buddha or not, and just sit. So the story comes back to the phrase we talked about this morning, Shikantaza, just sit. And as you said, Jan, throw away everything. Bye. Uh -huh. See you tomorrow. <laughs> That's very English way. Just in the bus. So, it's it's not often in in our lives that we do things without any purpose. Um, our, our, our whole modern lives, we do something to get a result. Like we work to earn money so we can live or, you know, it's endless. But um, the, the teachings that 
that I follow from Dogen, a, 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 a teaching us that there is something we can do which doesn't have an intention. And um, in modern life, it's easier to see what those kind of things are. Because um, even if you go to the gym and you get on the, the bicycle and you cycle, well, you can think that you're making your legs stronger, but actually while you're cycling, you're not doing it for any purpose, just you're cycling to cycle. So in lots of activities, we can see something similar to this teaching, doing something for the sake of doing it. And um, lots, of, lots of the stories are about life in the temple. So there's lots of these stories where the, you know, a monk is sweeping the floor and the, the one monk says to him, why are you sweeping the floor? And he says, uh, just I'm sweeping the floor. Uh, this kind of thing. Can you think of anything you do just for the sake of doing it? Hmm. Almost not. Like going to bed, you just go. Go to because bed. Because you're tired, so you don't think about it, you just go. Your eyes, your eyelids are kind of falling, so you just go to bed. With this, with this intention, it's actually, I've been kind of thinking about it. Uh, it's a little bit tricky because you need to have some goal or something to follow the journey, not to have the intention to be a better person or to become Buddha or whatever. But you just have to do it anyway, because if you don't do it, then it doesn't work. So how is it with the Zazen? You just do it as, as when you go to bed. So it's well, you have cleaning a goal. your teeth or something. So you do it in the morning and that's it. So Well, you can say so. Mm. You can just sit Zazen just like cleaning your teeth. Mm. Um, but um, we can say that we have a goal. The goal is not to have a goal. <laughs> so it means to do something just for its own sake. And it's not a common thing. We don't think that way in modern life, just to do something for its own sake. We always think we're doing something for some result. Yeah, I mean, it should be part of the routine or something because if I don't have a goal, like goal, I don't mean the goal to reach something or to yeah. gain something, but like my goal is to have regular practice of yoga, regular practice of zazen, at least yeah. short time because it's refreshment in the morning, it's yeah. good for me for the whole day. So it is goal in my opinion, it is kind well, of you goal. Have, you, we have, you, you can say you, you have a goal before you do it. Mm -hmm. But then you mean... You when you mean do it, of you course. give up your okay. goal. Okay, that's and true. And interestingly, in the book Inner Tennis, this is a very important mm. point for playing tennis. Ha! Huh. <laughs> you, you go out onto the court, mm. you want to win, okay? You've got a goal, very strong intention. Mm -hmm. But in the moment that you're there to hit the ball, you must forget about winning. Mm -hmm. You must drop off winning mm -hmm. completely. If you don't, you will lose the mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. Now this is why I like the book in a mm -hmm. tennis. which Miriam told me about. <laughs> um, so there are many, we have goals in life, 
But to give up our goal when we do something mm -hmm. is a very, it's the best way to achieve our goal. Mm -hmm. It sounds mm -hmm. weird. Uh, but anybody who does any kind of sport seriously mm. knows this fact. Can be art as well, like artist. <clears throat> Can be artist. Mm. I want to make the best picture ever. Mm. But you have to forget about your goal when you're painting. <clears throat> Music too. Mm. So it's, it's in everything actually. Um, but we don't notice the importance of dropping off our goal. So maybe we should all play tennis. <laughs> I've heard uh, Jaromir Jagr was saying this, the famous ice hockey player, that, uh, that he was a question how how it is that he's so good and he says I just love to play ice hockey mm -hmm. yes so you can hear many you can hear many people who do dancers for example when I dance I lose myself or um, I, if anybody plays musical instruments here mm -hmm. sometimes if you if you're in the right state you play, and uh, if you play the piano, it feels like there's no piano and player. It's just one thing. So this old story about Nangaku, Master Nangaku um, Basso, is talking about giving up the goal. So we can say that the goal of practicing zazen is to have no goal. Yes, I have a goal. It's to have no goal. My goal is to sit and give up my goal. another one or I, I don't mind if you want to say things in Czech I won't understand but other people will <laughs> understand it's fine actually this is how I get to Zazen uh, because I was sh shooting from a boat and I uh, found a book about uh, Zazen and archery and what was written in the book to make it very short was that when you just breathe and forget about that you are shooting, you are shooting correctly. Once you start thinking there is some object to be hit and that you are on a competition and so on, you never, you never do it correctly. Yes. And I found this working because when I was just breathing, the arrows were flying really automatically there. It was just breathing and it was just flying. And uh, when I started to think whatever small thought uh, it was like in the mirror of my thoughts, if they are there or not. It immediately appeared on the target. Yeah. I was not hitting the, the center, or I was not hitting. It was, it was not hit, I can say it like that. So after, I don't know, a couple of years, two, two, three years of technique, you just develop the technique, you can only focus on your breathing and it will fly there. It's, you, can, you can really forget about it. So that's my experience, and that's how I found dozen because uh, then I can have the same thing but without archery. Was it a book in Czech or English? I think it's it's also in English. Uh, uh, Zen and the Art of Archery. Or Probably. Or yeah. Or yeah. Harry Gow. Harry Gow was, I think. It's quite a famous book, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. 
Mm -hmm. I found it when I was something like 16. I started the archery when I was 14. So, so you, the, if you read a book like that, you can see something. But there's a big journey between seeing it in the book and living like that. Because uh, modern life makes us think about what we're doing all the time. Um, for instance, I give talks. I've been giving talks for 20 years. And when I started giving talks, I would be nervous. So I have to think what I'm going to say. But after 20 years, I realise that if I open my mouth, I say something. And as long as I don't get embarrassed by myself, <laughs> which I, I stop doing, then um, I, don't have, I don't have any intention to, to say something, most of the time. So it's, it's in everything. So this ancient story about not having intention uh, is in everything really in our actions when we act we can give up our intention there is a lot of liberation when we do not expect anything from something when I don't expect to achieve something, yeah. I am now free from expectations. So I yeah. have to be frustrated. But when I expect, yeah. that's very stressful. So, However, giving up your goal is scary. Yeah. Because we're, we're taught, I was taught, that you have to you know, know what you're going to do and then do it and then uh, it should work. So it's, it's like um, jumping in the water and you don't know if you'll swim or not. So uh, it can be scary if you're used to thinking, thinking, thinking and then trying to do what you're thinking it's it's a bit scary to stop doing that okay i'm not going to i'm not going to think about it i'm oh. <coughs> so what comes next if we have time I'll find another one. I can turn this on. Okay. Please talk to each other while I... <laughs> It seems that in ancient Buddhist China there were kind of um, um, well-known phrases in Buddhism that um, monks would ask their teacher and they, you know, that they became quite well known. Um, what's the sound, sound of one hand clapping? You know, everybody heard that. Mm -hmm. Or um, blah, 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 blah. So uh, one very common question in ancient Chinese Buddhism 
was um, connected with an Indian monk who came to China to teach them how to practice zazen and his name was Bodhidharma and he was actually an Indian prince in the ninth century and before that before that time Buddhism came from India to China in a very esoteric style so they had lots of beautiful statues and they did lots of um, like a Hindu kind of style and they did lots of um, religious practices like burning incense and so on but, um, it seems that Bodhidharma was the first teacher to teach uh, Zazen which in Indian in Sanskrit is Dhyana so he came from India to China and there's lots of stories about what happened to him but one one question that, people, that monks would ask is this what was Bodhidharma's intention when he came in coming from China uh, to China from India sounds a strange question really what was Bodhidharma's intention in coming to China from India why did he come in other words really what did he come for and um, the master said he just acted as he was he just acted as he was and the monk said would you tell me again what you just said in a way that I can understand it <laughs> and uh, the master said come here and the monk came and the master said remember this that's the end of the story <laughs> can you understand I have asked my bees uh, Marcus Coman I have written it on a paper and put it inside a hive you did? Yes. Um, what did they say? <laughs> they acted uh, Spodhidharma in my interpretation. They just did their natural uh, gnawing of and... They did their natural behaviour? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so perfect answer. Perfect answer. Yeah. You are kidding. You are kidding. No, no, you no, really no. did that? Mm -hmm. yeah, I saw wow. That. That's what I do, yeah. I saw How are you asking? Oh. So, um, that's why you know about honey so much. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Mm. Natural behavior. Mm. Um, people often ask me why I came back from Japan to England. People in England. <laughs> <laughs> they say, you know, why did you come back? They're thinking, you know, it must be great in Japan, blah, blah, blah. And I always make up, I make up answers. I, you know, you have to answer somebody. Well, in Japan, things were not so easy. And um, I didn't have such uh, interesting work. And then I make up more reasons. But actually, I don't have a reason. I just came. Actually. So we need reasons. So we, we give reasons. So that's what the story is about. So if somebody says to you, well, why did you do that? And you say, I just did it. <laughs> People think, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but actually,
actually, it's very truthful. <laughs> Why did you do that? Oh, I don't know. You just did it. Yes, but why? Wow. I just did it. <laughs> oh, good. We can stop now. So this is kind of, there's, there's 300, more than 300, 301 of these old stories. And they're all like this. They have some kind of very, very simple teaching in the story. Um, sometimes it, it's too simple. Um, there's another story that I can't find now. Um, where the monk says to the master, how did uh, Gautama Buddha, the Buddha, how did he teach people? And the master says, well, if they asked him a, a particular question about their lives, he would give them a concrete answer about their lives. If he asked them a general question about life, he gave a general answer. That's a story. <laughs> <laughs> you think, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but it's talking about something a bit deep, simple and deep. Which is if... If we ask a concrete question, we can get a concrete answer. If we ask a general question, we can get a general answer. Oh, yeah, everybody knows that. Everybody knows that. I do. Yeah, sometimes. When, they are, when the people are asking two general uh, philosophical questions. And abstract, so abstract. Abstract questions. People love to ask abstract questions because yeah. it's not so embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's easy to say um, something general. If you say something about yourself, it's a bit... Um, it's mm. like taking your clothes off, really. Mm. Answering general answer doesn't make sense to such abstract questions. No? Oh, well, it's a little bit different. Um, I, I find people in the in the West um, like to generalize, so it takes about this much of a second. To generalize in our brain so we hear something and then we immediately generalize it and make it an abstraction and then we discuss the abstraction so for instance um, if I say um, reality is here and now Everybody starts talking about reality is here and now. But I mean here and now, this here and this now and this reality. But we turn it into um, an abstraction. Oh yeah, reality is here and now. Yes, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> and then that we talk. 
about, you know, well, sometimes reality is not here. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, in that kind of situation, it, I, I want to tell the point, this, this here and now, this, this is what it's all about, this, this moment. To cut the obstruction and bring it to here and now. Yes. Because, in, especially in the West, we're so intelligent that we generalize um, more than people do in Japan and certainly in ancient China. Lots of these stories are very simple and concrete. They didn't generalize, they didn't make a general principle. So, in the first story, Nangaku polishes the tile. He doesn't say, ah, Basso, you must remember that you don't, <laughs> shouldn't have an intention in, when you're sitting in Zazen, because Zazen is not having an intention, blah, 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 blah. No, he did something concrete. You know, stupid. So it seems that in, certainly in ancient China and in uh, ancient Japan, uh, people didn't need to generalize so quickly. But in the West, we're, we've developed our theories to such an excellent level that we need quickly to generalize and get, you know, there's a big plane crash and next thing is on the news, what lessons can we learn? Whoa, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> it's too soon. <laughs> the, the plane crashes happen, you know, it happens all the time. Something happens, oh, we, we must talk about uh, in general and learn the lesson so it doesn't happen next time. Well, what about dealing with what's here now? And it's it's part of our culture, <coughs> part of our Western civilization. It's a habit. It's a habit. Yeah. We need a general rule. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's like we're enchanted. I remember some moments when you were pointing at now and here, yeah, and we were not able to get of the enchantment, and still the magic habit was. No, oh, but um, I think that. No, now. <laughs> yes. Still, still working. Yes. And in some of the ancient stories, when this happened, the master would hit the monk <laughs> with a stick or turn the table over. <laughs> um, which is the same thing. It's saying, no, 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 no. Here, stop it. You can generalize tomorrow. You can't. Tomorrow <laughs> never happens. <laughs> so so it's, um, it's very, very powerful. And, and um, as I think I said yesterday, uh, in the West we need somebody to tell us why we're doing something before we can do it. And it, it, if you go to Japan or China, you find that generally people don't need that. They just do, like, um, I'm going to show you how to put the glasses in the case, right? Mm -hmm. So I just could do this, and then you just do the same, right? But in the West, I have to say, now this is called a case, and these are glasses, and now I open the case, <laughs> I put the glasses in like this, and then you say, ah, oh, I understand, <laughs> now I can do it. Protects the glasses, oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a stupid example, but um, we, we need it. Yeah. So we can stop now. <laughs> <laughs>